Okay. Um, so welcome everybody to our seminar. Um, my name is Becca Schomer. I'm a postdoc in microbiology and molecular genetics department here, um, primarily with Dr. Becky Prellis. And recently I started working on a project uh, where I'm co-advised by our speaker today, Dr. Tiffany Lowpower. So I'm very excited to introduce her because I really admire her work and her enthusiasm about science in general. Um, Dr. Tiffany Lowpower started her career in science at Georgia Institute of Technology, where she did her bachelor's degree. Um, she moved to University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, where she did her uh, graduate uh, PhD, um, where she became interested in plant pathogens, specifically Ralstonia, and worked under Dr. Caitlin Allen. Uh, she then moved out west for a brief postdoc with do, uh, Dr. Steve Lindau um, at UC Berkeley before uh, she started her assistant professorship here at UCD. And she started in the summer of 2019. And despite um, all of the craziness that this first year has brought, um, she's gotten her lab uh, up and started and has uh, put together an excellent little cohort of trainees. Um, and with that, I'll pass the mic over to Tiffany, who's going to Tell us about why plants wilt today. Great, um, thank you, Becca. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, start just with a, a Zoom setting that I recently discovered while teaching. Um, in the top corner of your Zoom, uh, there's this little view button that kind of looks like a movie, uh, like clapper um, thing. If you click that, um, you can change how you set up your Zoom uh, and you can do the side by side of the speaker so that my face is on the side of my slides. Um, and it doesn't obscure any of the, the slides. Um, so uh, it's up there in the top right corner under view. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a project uh, where we looked at the physiology of tomato plants as they underwent uh, wilting disease caused by Ralstonia bacteria. Um, oh, and I also want to uh, invite you to use the Zoom chat um, as much as you want uh, to interact with your colleagues or to keep yourself awake. Um, I won't be distracted um, by the, the flashing orange, so feel free to, um, to chat away. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, but before I talk about the, this project on uh, plant physiology, I want to briefly highlight uh, the main focus of our research lab. Uh, this might be my first introduction to uh, many of uh, my colleagues uh, here in the microbiology seminar series. Um, so I want to highlight some other aspects of our work. Um, we are predominantly interested in bacterial behavior in the low power lab. Um, so we think a lot about how bacteria are responding to their environmental conditions. Um, and in this case, uh, the environmental conditions would be both the plant host um, and soil and water environments where Ralstonia can transmit between plants. Um, so Ralstonia is a bacterial pathogen that can infest the soil um, and it will chemotax towards exudate chemicals that roots uh, exude when they're growing through soil. It then gains entry to the root uh, through wounds or natural openings and then it'll migrate its way into the xylem vessels of plants. And these xylem vessels are responsible for transporting water from roots to the shoots. Uh, the pathogen uh, spreads systemically through the xylem, similar to a bacteremia or a blood infection, where it makes the systemic infection of plants. It then um, at, uh, causes wilt symptoms because it disrupts the flow of that xylem sap. And at late stage disease, the bacteria will escape back out of the roots and return to the soil. Uh, where they can survive um, over winter or when uh, the crop plants are not present, uh, both in the deep soil as well as in the rhizosphere of uh, weedy plants that might be in a field. And so our lab is interested in understanding the genetic adaptations that Ralstonia has to complete each part of this life cycle. And we have um, several projects that are investigating different parts of this. Um, so my uh, PhD student uh, Stratton Georgilis is investigating some genes that contribute to uh, systemic spread of the bacteria. Uh, and he's mentored two undergraduate researchers on a summer bioinformatics project uh, working on these genes. Um, we uh, also have a postdoc, Brian Engel, who is uh, studying uh, traits that contribute to Ralstonia's uh, escape from the plants and 
persistence in uh, fresh water. Uh, Dr. Uh, Becca Schomer introduced herself, um, and she is co-advised by Dr. Becky Perales and is studying the specificity of chemotaxis um, uh, in many bacteria, but um, is using Ralstonia as one of her model systems. Um, additionally, we have projects that are investigating the host range of this pathogen. So the Ralstonia are known to infect plants in over 50 botanical species. And uh, not much is known about uh, what genes are determining the host range. Um, so we're uh, delving into a few model systems, uh, model clades of Ralstonia to detangle uh, genetic factors that contribute to banana and melon pathogenicity. Um, additionally, uh, this last year, I've been uh, working with global disease biology undergraduates at UC Davis to uh, complete a meta-analysis of the literature uh, to document the diversity, host range, and geographic distribution of different Ralstonia clades. Um, and so they're tackling uh, over 100 papers that cite, uh, that, that record the diversity of Ralstonia in different regions and on different host plants. Um, and this is pretty exciting because I don't think anyone's um, uh, comprehensively analyzed this data since uh, the 60s. Um, so there's a lot more to, to discover. Um, and so uh, in a future seminar, I'll be talking more about these projects um, once we've really gotten our feet up and under us. Um, and it, especially uh, using a technique that um, we're really excited about in the lab, which is uh, transposon sequencing. Um, so we've adapted transposon sequencing uh, to do high throughput genetic screens to identify uh, which genes are contributing to these different life cycle stages. Um, and we have some of that data now that we're parsing through, um, but it's not enough to make a full seminar out of. <laughs> so stay tuned. Um, for today's seminar, we're going to be looking uh, more at the host physiology. Um, so uh, how does this bacterial pathogen cause the um, really charismatic wilt symptoms that we see in plants? Um, and, and for this project, we're using tomato plants as a model host. Um, I want to start by acknowledging many collaborators uh, on this project. This project uh, taught me a lot about plants. Um, I am not a plant physiologist. I'm a bacteriologist uh, at, at heart. Um, but I wanted to understand more about the environment that uh, Ralstonia and other xylem pathogens are uh, taking advantage of. And so I began to uh, network with uh, a xylem physiologist at UW-Madison during my PhD. And uh, Kate McCullough suggested some early experiments uh, that helped us characterize uh, the physiology of wilting plants. Um, and I, I call that data, uh, it was kind of, uh, you know, lab bench drawer data, where it was a nicely done experiment, but it didn't really fit in anywhere. <laughs> um, so we it just kind of sat around for a while. Um, and then during my postdoc at UC Berkeley, uh, I realized that uh, someone whose papers I really respected was actually a professor at UC Davis, um, which was just down the road. Um, and Andrew McElron has been using a uh, medical imaging approach, um, x-ray computed tomography, to image the physiology of xylem plant, or uh, the physiology of xylem in plants. And so uh, I emailed Andrew enough times that he responded to me and agreed to collaborate. Um, additionally, we have some great uh, cell biologists and developmental uh, plant biologists who helped uh, contribute some really exquisite microscopy to this project. Um, and uh, my postdoc, who I mentioned before, uh, Brian Engel, has been uh, helping to wrap up the data analysis for this project so that we can submit it for publication soon. So I want to introduce you to uh, Ralstonia wilt disease. Uh, and we, if we were not on Zoom right now, I would be showing a time-lapse video. Uh, but time-lapse videos don't tend to work that well on Zoom. They tend to lag. Um, so in lieu of a video, I've taken several screenshots of uh, disease progression so I can walk you through a couple stagnant shots. Um, but if you Google Ralstonia wilt of tomato, um, you should be able to find this uh, video by uh, my colleague, Dr. John Jacobs. And so in this video, you see uh, that this tomato plant has been infected by Ralstonia. Uh, 
Um, and since it's a soil-borne pathogen, our uh, inoculation method is rather simple. We pour the bacterial suspension straight into the soil and then uh, watch as the disease progresses. Uh, this plant is a healthy control. And what you'll see in this video is that this uh, leaflet of the, the plant is going to succumb to wilt first. Um, so you see that some of the leaflets begin to lose their turgor um, and they become floppy and wilted. And over time, you start to see additional wilt symptoms appear on other pedials of the tomato plant. What we can see is that overnight, um, sometimes plants are able to recover partially and uh, uh, transport enough water that they perk up slightly. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the disease almost always progresses to a complete wilt where the plant completely collapses. And as I've uh, seen this disease uh, progress through hundreds and thousands of tomato plants, um, I became really intrigued by the, the stepwise progression of the wilt symptoms and also the fact that uh, sometimes on a, a given pedial, we see that uh, there are wilted leaflets, but other leaflets that have um, might still have turgor. Um, and sometimes this is even a divide across the, the pedial where on one half of the leaflet, um, they're, they're wilted and on the, on the other half, they're um, completely, uh, you know, uh, turgid and, you know, uh, unwilted. And so, um, yeah, so I'll actually get to that in a second. Um, but the central question that we're asking is, what is the physiological mechanism by which Ralstonia bacteria uh, uh, cause wilt symptoms and uh, block, disrupt the function of the xylem? And this question um, is, a, is a pretty simple question, uh, but surprisingly, uh, although we, the Ralstonia community always uh, says the same thing in the introductions to our paper, um, we haven't actually been able to directly test the mechanism before. Um, so in all the introductions of our paper, we say that uh, Ralstonia invades the xylem, it grows uh, prolifically and produces copious amounts of, uh, of uh, of biofilm and clogs the vessels, which causes the plants to wilt and die. Um, uh, I'm going to jump through this. <laughs> um, and so that's the dogma. Um, the dogma is that uh, all of this bacterial ooze is directly clogging the xylem vessels and the plants cannot transport, uh, transport the xylem sap. But as a counterpoint, um, if you've grown Ralstonia on a plate, you see that it is uh, immediately you see that it's drippy. So as a classical bacteriologist, um, you know, we're taught to invert our plates so that we don't get condensation on our auger. Um, but that's kind of a no go for Ralstonia, because if you invert the plates and have the bacteria on that auger, they actually drip onto the lid. Um, and then if you flip them back and forth, um, you know, they can escape through the edges of your Petri dish. Um, so it's a very, very uh, fluidal bacteria um, and makes this quite drippy, oozy uh, biofilm. Moreover, if we take a plant that's infected with Ralstonia and um, cut it at the, the base of the stem, uh, in, a healthy, in healthy plants, um, you'll continue to get xylem sap that oozes out of the, the stump, and that's because there's a root pressure that provides positive pressure to push the xylem sap up to the stump. And we still see that the, the sap will accumulate on the stump of infected plants, and uh, in infected plants, it's uh, tur uh, turbid with bacterial biomass. Um, so we see that this is a very drippy bacteria that, you know, can move and, and be pushed out of the xylem. So I, I was wondering whether the dogma was actually true. Um, and if the dogma is not the reason, what are the other mechanisms that could disrupt uh, vascular function? Um, one mechanism could be uh, that uh, plant immunity causes collateral damage after it responds to the pathogen. Uh, so there's a, a specialized form of plant immunity that takes place in the xylem. And that's when the living cells that are adjacent to the xylem vessels respond to a pathogen. And then they have a developmental approach where they produce this structure called a tylosis, which is, um, ha has a cell wall, 
and uh, are these little balloon shaped structures that um, exude into a, a xylem vessel and can wall off the vessel, which can uh, prevent the spread of uh, xylem pathogens between vessels. And so this can be a very effective immune response against certain uh, plant pathogens. But if you have too much uh, formation or inappropriate formation of tyloses, it can also be a form of autoimmunity where the plant uh, clogs up its own xylem and prevents um, sufficient sap from being transported. Um, a third technique or a third mechanism uh, is one that I was particularly intrigued by. So this is whether um, there is a role for gas embolisms in contributing to xylem dysfunction during wilt disease. Uh, and gas embolisms are, uh, could occur uh, when gas either enters the xylem uh, from extracellular spaces or if uh, sufficient gas is produced by the bacteria in the xylem. And unlike our uh, blood and our circulatory systems, uh, the transport of xylem sap operates under negative pressure. Um, it generally operates by uh, the evaporation of water through the leaf stomata, which then uh, creates a negative pressure and tension that pulls the xylem sap upwards. So under these negative pressures, um, gas could be pulled into the xylem vessel through these uh, pit membranes that uh, border cell, uh, that that border or separate xylem vessels from the the living tissues, um, and the pit membranes are composed of cellulose and have very small uh, pore sizes, and the small pore size provides uh, physical resilience to prevent the uh, entry of gas across the membrane. Um, but one thing that bacterial xylem pathogens do is they produce enzymes that they secrete. Uh, and these, many of these secreted enzymes are cellulases and pectinases that are able to uh, punch holes in these pit membranes. And those holes are actually one way that xylem pathogens are able to move from vessel to vessel. And that a uh, pathogen like Ralstonia that breaks out of the xylem can, um, can exit the xylem. Um, additionally, uh, I mentioned that if the bacteria produce gas, that might be a way that uh, vessels be could become embolized and non-functional for sap transport. Um, and uh, all Ralstonia are able to respire on nitrate, and uh, two of the major phylotypes are able to undergo complete denitrification to produce dinitrogen gas. Um, and so it was a... a a hand wavy uh, question that a, one of my colleagues had who worked on the uh, denitrification pathway as to whether Ralstonia could cause the bends in plants, um, which would be uh, the uh, nitrogen gas is very poorly soluble. And so could Ralstonia's metabolism produce sufficient amounts that it would um, uh, cavitate and uh, displace the sap? Um, so do we have bacterial clogging? Uh, plant immunity clogging, or one of these other mechanisms of uh, gas embolisms. So in order to test that, um, I managed to convince uh, Andrew McLaron, um, who's a USDA ARS scientist at Davis, um, and also uh, in the viticulture department. Um, and Andrew uh, has been using X-ray computed uh, micro or micro computed tomography to visualize uh, xylem function of uh, multiple plants, uh, mostly grapevines in their lab. Um, and this method is uh, based on the simple x-ray. So we all know from uh, looking at x-rays of uh, human anatomy that uh, in x-rays we can see uh, the density of biological tissues. So bones will show up white because they're very dense and they reflect more of the, um, the electrons, uh, the x-rays. Um, whereas uh, softer fleshy tissues show up somewhat gray and um, gases show up as black because they have very low density. And so that's a, a, a two-dimensional x-ray. The computed tomography comes into place because uh, you take 3D or uh, you take x-rays across 180 degrees. Um, so uh, in our case, we have a sample that will rotate 180 degrees within this X-ray beam that's actually coming off the one of the particle accelerators on the Lawrence Berkeley um, Labs Advanced Light Center. Um, 
And uh, this is a slight contrast to medical imaging for CT. In that case, um, you can't get a person to stand still as they were rotated 180 degrees. So you have a, a very large instrument that rotates around the patient. Um, but in this case, we can um, find ways to stabilize our plants to rotate them in the beam line. So while this uh, sample is rotating 180 degrees, um, multiple uh, two-dimensional images are recorded on the detector. Um, and these are um, sideways views of the, of the stem. Um, and when we take all hundred, the hundreds of these images and run them through uh, several scripts that perform Fourier transformations that can reconstruct the 3D structure of the original sample, um, we get multiple uh, 2D images where we have a cross section of our stem and uh, we can pan up and down the height of the stem like a, a Z stack uh, that you would use and be interfacing with in confocal microscopy. Um, so we're able to get um, 3D resolution of the, the tissue. And in the case of our uh, our, our platform, we're able to have a, a one micron, a cubic micron uh, resolution size, where each uh, voxel, which is a volume pixel, uh, represents about one micron. Um, so we're not able to see uh, individual bacterial cells with this approach because they'd be below that, uh, they would not resolve in, in with this, um, but we can uh, see the, the plant tissue exquisitely. And so in the, the pictures I'm gonna show you, uh, wider areas of the tissue are more dense than blacker areas, which are uh, of low density. Uh, in order to do this experiment, um, Andrew's lab is um, writes grants to the Lawrence Berkeley Labs for uh, three days of beamline every every so often. Um, and then Andrew uh, manages the, the time schedule so that different projects get eight hour shifts to image as much um, as you can during the eight hours. Um, and I was quite lucky to get the, the prime daytime shifts a few times, but at least one of my experiments was an overnight run <laughs> at the um, beam line, which was, it mostly worked. <laughs> Um, and so my uh, experimental design that we chose for this, we had to have all the plants um, prepared um, to be imaged at the same time. And, and what I wanted to see uh, was uh, a how wilt disease progresses and, and what that looks like in the tissue. Um, so we had tomato plants that were mock inoculated. Um, and then we also uh, used an inoculation method that allows us to synchronize infection. Um, so although this is a soil-borne pathogen, we're also able to directly inoculate it into the xylem. And what I did is uh, cut off one of those pedial branches and place a suspension of the bacteria onto the stump, uh, which gives them direct access to the xylem. And this is, a, uh, this is a very efficient way to synchronize infection. And so I did this at one day and two days before um, the scheduled experiment times at the X-ray micro CT scanner. Um, and in the one day samples, this would be a pre-symptomatic time point. And in the two day samples, uh, the plants had a range of symptoms from fully wilted uh, down to partially wilted and asymptomatic. Um, for our first experimental design, uh, it was very exploratory and we wanted to see uh, what we were able to see. Um, additionally, I think this was Andrew's first time imaging the stem of uh, tomato plants. He has most of his experience in grapevines. Um, so we were interested to see if these more herbaceous, um, less woody, less rigid plants were also um, amenable to being imaged um, at the beam line. So I mentioned that we have to secure the sample so that it doesn't move during the scanning. Uh, we were able to make a, a platform that uh, wedged the stem between two styrofoam blocks. Um, we then put it onto the uh, a piece of the instrument that rotates uh, within the beam line. And so the, the electrons will actually come out of this area and then be read um, onto this detector. And so um, we rotate the sample 180 degrees and take many x-ray images. Um, and then after reconstructing the 3D, uh, or this is a 2D cross section, but we have to do the 3D reconstruction and then look at individual slices. Um, this is what we get. 
And I want to walk you through what we're seeing here because um, it's both a, a interesting way to look at a plant and also um, not everyone's familiar with looking at xylem. Um, so this is one of our plant, uh, samples from healthy plants. Uh, and what you can see in this purple circle, which I've enlarged over here, although it's a little bit blurry on my screen, um, this is a bundle of xylem vessels. So xylem is, uh, xylem vessels are hollowed out tubes that are arranged in uh, these uh, xylem clusters. And the walls of xylem vessels become reinforced with lignin, which is a very strong polymer and is the polymer that gives wood its strength. Um, and because it's a very strong, dense polymer, we can actually see it show up as wider outlines of the xylem vessels uh, with this approach. And uh, if you look at microscopy um, of tomato xylem, you immediately recognize these clusters as being the xylem vessels. Um, and so the location of xylem vessels in tomato plants are along the periphery of the stem, um, and they're in somewhat random uh, arrangements of clusters. Um, in this image, I also like to point out um, that sometimes we get imaging artifacts. Um, so this is uh, some blurring that happened because this sample itself uh, moved during the imaging. Um, and because of the, the 180 degree rotation, there's no parameters that we can input into the, the reconstruction software to reconstruct this whole image um, in one go. Um, but we can uh, apply parameters that allow us to focus on the areas that are of interest to us and uh, allow this to be somewhat of a, a black box, the center of the, the plant stem. Um, but when we see what these artifacts really look like are um, these moon-like tails that uh, come out of um, areas where we have high and low density. Um, and these black spots here are actually uh, uh, gas, gas filled spaces between really turgid um, stem cells there that are um, uh, so turgid that they're circular and just leaving a little bit of uh, gaps between the corners of where those cells join. Um, but where they get blurry, you can see that they've got these tails. Okay, um, so this particular sample did not have any embolized uh, xylem vessels. If we had seen embolisms, they would have uh, looked like black uh, circles or ovals instead of um, uh, vessels that have these gray lumens. Um, and so we don't see uh, many embolisms in the samples from healthy plants. Uh, but one of our questions was uh, whether embolisms are correlating with uh, wilt symptom to progression. And overall, I don't think we can conclusively say much about this, um, because unfortunately for this experiment, our sample size is a bit small. Um, and then the pandemic hit, so I don't think we're likely <laughs> to um, be doing another replicate. Um, but from this sample, from this uh, small sample size experiment, um, we did calculate, uh, quantify the bacterial density in each sample using digital droplet PCR. Um, and one thing that I find intriguing is that uh, there might be an early uh, part of the disease where the bacteria have secreted these cellulases that we know are key virulence enzymes. And these cellulases might have uh, made enough damage to the pit membranes to allow uh, more air to enter the xylem vessels. So I've, I've graphed the healthy uh, samples on the limited detection. And we had two samples that had no embolisms and one that had, a, uh, had two embolisms. Um, but overall, this is a very low number. Um, six embolized non-functional vessels due to air embolisms is not going to be sufficient uh, to cause wilting symptoms. Um, these plant samples had about 70 xylem vessels, and so they had sufficient uh, redundancy to be able to allow uh, the, the, the sap transport. Um, but there might be an early point where uh, there are some embolized vessels that we then don't see at later stage diseases, disease because the bacteria at that point has grown sufficiently uh, two orders of magnitude more, um, and maybe they completely fill the vessels. Um, but I don't know that we can really say that, but I want, I would like to know. 
Um, overall, uh, we can conclude that embolisms are unlikely to be a dominant mechanism of xylem function dysfunction, xylem vessel dysfunction during wilt. Um, there's very few gas embolisms, even in the infected plants. Um, so after we got that result, um, we, we could see these uh, results coming in um, as we were scanning. Um, and it, it, it was looking like the infected plants uh, looked almost identical to the healthy plants. Uh, and so I was getting a little disappointed. I really wanted to see uh, evidence for gas embolisms because I knew exactly which bacterial mutants I would make to then test. Um, but it seemed like that that plan was was not going to work out. Um, but then um, my collaborator, Andrew, had a, a really nice suggestion of an altered experimental design that would allow us to directly test the functionality of the xylem. Um, and so we developed a functional imaging assay. So for this approach, um, we, instead of looking at uh, stems of plants that have their intact roots and intact leaves, we looked at uh, segments of stems that were excised uh, one centimeter above and below our inoculation point. Um, and we briefly dehydrated that the, the stem sample. And during this dehydration, any of those xylem vessels that were um, cut open and exposed to the air uh, would uh, transport their sap out into the air. The, the sap would um, dehydrate out of, out of the vessel. And then we would be able to image these uh, now air-filled vessels um, and see that they were, were black. But if any of the xylem vessels have clogs in them that prevent the um, evaporation of sap or prevent the evaporation of the contents of the vessel, then we would not um, see gas filled vessels. Um, so we dehydrated the stem and then imaged these stem segments. And uh, this is an image of one of the healthy plants uh, from this experimental design. Um, so in this case, uh, what, what we're seeing here are many air-filled vessels that are uh, characterized by this dark gray to, to black color. Um, and I've indicated three of those here in this blown up view. And this one is near impossible to see, but if you squint and you adjust your, your screen just right, um, you might be able to see a slight um, outline of a xylem vessel um, and then a, a sap-filled lumen to that vessel. And so in healthy plants, um, we can really easily see the xylem now. Um, it's, it's these clusters of xylem vessels that are uh, arranged around the stem. Um, and these were all vessels that were, um, we, we can assume that they were sap filled before um, this, the dehydration because we saw that so few uh, vessels are embolized in our intact plants. So these, these vessels have now emptied their contents and, uh, and become air filled. Um, so we're able to count the number of uh, sap conducting vessels. And uh, we see that um, the, the mock inoculated healthy plants um, have a high number of xylem vessels um, and they're, uh, that are functional and they are um, spread around the stem. In contrast, uh, the uh, two day post inoculation samples that have been infected with Ralstonia um, have far fewer uh, numbers of vessels that are functional and able to transport uh, xylem sap out into the air. Additionally, there's whole regions of the stem that you would expect to see xylem vessels in, um, but you don't see vessels, or sometimes you see just you know little uh, uh, xylem vessels that uh, are seem to be alone. You don't see the clear clustering that you see in the healthy plants. Um, so the, the wilt disease changes both the, reduces both the number of functional vessels and also uh, changes the spatial orientation of the spatial, um, yes, changes where, where the, the xylem sap is being transported. It clogs certain parts of the vessels. Um, and so, uh, once again, we, we took these samples and we quantified the bacterial load. And we see that um, at, in um, asymptomatic plants, um, although there's an increasing bacterial density, it's not enough to reduce the overall number of functional vessels. 
Um, but at some threshold, the bacterial density has increased sufficiently that we get a reduction of uh, functional vessels. And then here in green, I've shown um, the samples from plants that had wilt symptoms. So there's uh, even a decrease in the number of functional vessels somewhat before we get the wilt symptoms. And it's a really close um, threshold if we look at um, the, the gross bacterial density. And so this would be in homogenized tissue. When we get these um, uh, CFU per gram, we don't know exactly which, uh, you know, how, how distributed those bacteria were in those island vessels. Um, and if we take, so, so with these samples, we also, uh, on, on my part, fairly poorly preserved them in ethanol. Um, and our collaborators at Purdue uh, performed microscopy on it. Um, and I, I say poorly because they got a bit crushed. Um, so this is what the, the sample looked like um, in the scanner. And then for microscopy, um, I had uh, crushed it a little bit. So it, it's a little bit deformed. Um, but luckily, the xylem is not deformed because the lignin moles are, are quite reinforced. Um, and if we look into the xylem vessels, um, we do see um, these characteristic bacterial aggregates um, of, of Ralstonia within the vessels. And sometimes we see the bacteria um, uh, clogging, you know, taking up the majority of the space. And other times, um, there's just a partial occlusion. Um, one additional thing that our, our collaborators at Peru, uh, Peru, uh, Purdue did uh, was uh, histochemical staining of a large number of our samples. And this allowed us to uh, quantify the, the state of xylem vessels um, across, um, across multiple conditions. And in these images, um, the toluene blue dye um, stains the acidic xylem wall, this cyan color, um, and then um, stains the other tissue a dark blue color. So we can see bacterial biomass um, as well as um, other tissue. Um, and so uh, uh, Brian in my lab uh, uh, looked uh, at all of these um, images and uh, classified uh, the, the state of the xylem in, in these uh, same samples that we had um, x-rayed. Um, and so there's multiple different states that we see. So uncolonized vessels, um, some with just a few cells, uh, partial occlusions and full occlusions. Uh, and what we see is that um, in the pre-symptomatic plants, um, it's actually rather hard to, to see the, the Ralstonia. Um, similarly, in these same plants, we did not see any reductions in the um, number of uh, functional vessels. Uh, but then in uh, later stage disease, we see an increased number of um, vessels where bacteria have occluded the vessel. Um, and one additional thing that we see, um, and it was something I didn't notice at first when looking at the x-ray images, um, but what's really exciting about um, our data is we actually see that the bacterial biofilm seems to increase the density of the xylem lumen. Um, so this is one of the, the samples from an infected plant. Um, and we've zoomed in here on, on this region. Um, and so we see some vessels that look uh, similar to all the vessels we see in the um, healthy plants where we have this, this white lignin ring um, and then a dark gray lumen. Uh, but especially when we um, equally enhance the contrast across the image, uh, we see that the, in the Ralstonia infected plants, there's many samples where the density of the xylem lumen is uh, very similar to that lignin wall. Um, so that's showing that the, the bacterial biomass, although it's drippy and possible to move uh, with xylem sap, it is increasing the density and probably uh, slowing down the, the transport of the sap. Um, and what's really nice about this data set um, is that we're able to not just look at single cross sections, but actually um, cut down the Z-stack and look at horizontal images. Um, so in this uh, picture outlined in blue, I've drawn a line uh, from this left to right, um, where this is left to right. Um, and, and this line goes over these vessels that are embolized. Um, we can see those here. Um, and this is what xylem vessels look like where they end, where they hit these, these tapers, and then there'll be a pit membrane that uh, attaches it to the next vessel. Um, and so we see some embolized vessels. Um, but what uh, 
The other thing we see is uh, some vessels that have that lignant ring. So we see a white border and then um, you know, a, a gray filling. It looks uh, like a, a sap filled vessel. Um, but I became more convinced that what I was seeing in these, um, you know, ghost like uh, bacteria filled vessels uh, were definitely bacteria filled vessels when I saw it from the side, um, because we can see more clearly that uh, there is um, something of the right uh, shape and size of a xylem vessel, but it's filled with this bacterial toothpaste. Um, so the conclusion from this that is that uh, we've proved the dogma. Um, so we uh, functionally tested the, the hypothesis that Ralstonia uh, biofilm clogs the xylem vessels. Um, and by coupling a functional assay to imaging, we we're able to uh, see that this uh, bacterial biomass reduces the functionality of xylem vessels. Um, and I'm not going to touch on this uh, too much, um, but I do want to say that this is uh, not the only mechanism for vascular dysfunction by bacteria that infect xylem of plants. Uh, so there's this other bacterial genus, xylella, that also is a xylem pathogen. Um, and in the case of that uh, system, uh, it, it seems to be uh, the plant autoimmunity hypothesis. Uh, the formation of these tyloses is uh, what causes the, the disease symptoms in susceptible plants. And resistant plants seem to tolerate the bacteria better and not mount this intense response. Um, and this is an up close of a tylosi where you can see uh, some xylella cells um, attaching to it. Um, and they were also able to use X-ray micro CT uh, to look at um, other parts of uh, plant physiology where they actually used it to quantify the depletion of starches in the um, ray parenchyma cells. Um, so th there's a lot of uh, uh, potential for translating some of these medical imaging uh, uh, platforms for studying plant physiology. Um, so with that, um, I would like to thank you all for your attention, especially uh, over the Zoominar um, and during the pandemic. Um, and I'd like to take any questions. I have a couple of questions, if I may. Yeah, please. Um, so the the first thing that comes to my mind, we were just talking about uh, the bacterial biofilm and how you, you observed that it was denser than the sap. And um, I realized that you probably haven't looked at this, but the first question that comes up for me is, um, is why that would be, because when you were growing the organism in vitro, it was actually quite runny. And when I think of plant sap, I always think of something that's, I mean, I'm, I'm not a plant person here, but I always think of something that's kind of not very runny. So I, I'm just wondering whether there's any information about uh, phenotypic difference between the organism when it's um, in vitro versus in vivo and whether there might be something interesting to explore there, if you had any thoughts or comments about that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, so I'll start with, uh, yes, behavior in culture is like often, it can line up with behavior in the host, um, but there's many cases where we see that's not true. Um, and for Ralstonia, one of the most important ones is that uh, a quorum sensing phenotype. Um, in culture, we find that quorum sensing turns off the expression of the type three secretion system at high cell densities. Um, and this was discovered in the early 90s and led the Ralstonia community to develop a, a model that turned out to be wrong, where they thought that the bacteria only used its type 3 secretion system when it was at low cell densities. Um, but it turns out that there's um, something about being in the plant environment that bypasses that quorum sensing circuit um, and induces type 3 secretion uh, at high cell densities within the plant. Um, so behavior can definitely be different. Um, it is, it, it's an interesting question as to whether the polysaccharides are different uh, when Ralstonia is growing on uh, culture or in plants. Um, the, 
thesis work by uh, my colleague who worked on the denitrification pathway. Uh, she also worked on, on uh, ammonia assimilation or nitrate assimilation, I forget. Sorry, I know that's a big difference. Um, but uh, one thing she found is that when Ralstonia was grown on our rich media, um, which is a, a case amino acids pepto media, um, she, she grew the, the bacteria on our normal rich media. And then she also added extra nitrate to some media. Um, and the bacteria produced a different, um, uh, you know, a, obviously different colony morphology on the two. Um, and she measured viscosity differences. And I forget. What, what direction it went. Um, so there's definitely already precedence for even in culture, the bacteria can make multiple polysaccharides. Um, and then the, the final thing is uh, the sap you were, uh, you're used to is polyphloem sap. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit stickier and gummier. Um, and, and it's definitely like the, the white um, latexy kind of sap that you're gonna see. Um, if you want to sacrifice any tomato plants in your garden, um, water them well overnight and then cut them off at the stem. Um, and you'll, you'll get this, uh, so not all plants will uh, exude xylem sap like this. It's what makes xylem, uh, tomatoes a really nice model for us. Um, Cause we can use xylem sap as like a, you know, ex vivo culturing system for the bacteria for targeted questions. Um, but, but tomatoes will actually exude xylem sap uh, in, in their stumps, but some, uh, like we're starting to work in cucurbits um, and those when we cut them open, uh, there's a phloem defense where they exude phloem sap and it oxidizes and makes like, I didn't think about this. My master's student was like, oh, it scabs over. And I was like, oh, it is the exact mechanism of scabbing because you get these protein cages that protect the xylem and phloem. Um, but tomatoes, they, they don't have that. Um, so they're really easy to work with. <laughs> Thank you. That's fascinating. And and actually, and if I, I I hate to dominate, but um, the other question that I had, um, hopefully, I'm reading my notes right here. Oh, so then you jumped right at the very end and you talked about the xylella and its infection of grapevines, and and you said that that does seem to be clogged by the autoimmune function that you talked about. And so th for me, that kind of pops up the question of, so what's really going on that's different? What's the, what's the, um, uh, the Rostonia doing that's not triggering that? Or you, you know what I mean? The, what, what's the, the communication that's going on there? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, Xylella is a really fun contrast to Ralstonia because they are complete opposites in almost any dimension. Um, Xylella is, has undergone um, a very different lifestyle approach. Um, it's uh, what my postdoc advisor called a failed endophyte, um, where endophytes are bacteria that live in plants. Um, and uh, it's had a genome reduction. It is completely restricted to the xylem vessels of plants. Whereas Ralstonia is able to escape the xylem and live um, throughout the stem. Um, and the key difference there is uh, xylella is related to Xanthomonas uh, bacteria, uh, but xylella has lost its type three secretion system. And so it's um, the, the thought is that rather than manipulate the plant immune system, xylella's, xylella's approach is to generally avoid it. Um, so it's it's a very fastidious, slow growing pain in the butt to work with. And I kind of gave up on it during my postdoc. Um, it's not a very good system for bacterial genetics. It's also sticky as heck. So it's really hard to transform and get single colonies and the, they're all contaminated because it takes two weeks to get colonies. Um, so, so in pretty much every sense, uh, like disease progression takes months for that one. Uh, and so that's also more consistent with it coming from uh, plant, uh, the plant immunity, but the bacteria also grows slower. Um, so there, there definitely are, like if you do microscopy with xylella, you can find xylem vessels where the bacteria are packed in there. Um, but live dead staining shows that most of those bacteria have compromised membranes and might be dead. Um, so yeah, just everything about, uh, about xylella is a little bit opposite of Ralstonia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thanks.